fungus usually brings to mind unpleasant things like athlete's foot and plant diseases. But the world of fungus also includes mushrooms and a whole array of organisms without which life as we know it could not exist. Let's take a look at this little understood world and see why it is so interesting and important. First of all, because fungus is so different from all other forms of life, science has put it in a kingdom of its own. At first glance, fungi seem to be some sort of plant, but because they lack chlorophyll, they cannot synthesize their own food from sunlight and chemicals. They must obtain their energy from organic sources, such as plant tissue, both dead and living. In this respect, they are more like animals than plants. To understand fungi, let's take a look at the life cycle of a common mushroom. A mushroom is to a fungus what a fruit is to a tree. In fact, it is called the fruiting body because it contains the spores for the next generation. Fungal spores differ from plant seeds primarily in that they contain no initial food supply and will not germinate unless provided with an appropriate organic food source. Spores are also incredibly small, and individuals can only be seen with a microscope. They come in a wide variety of shapes and colors and are very important in positively identifying specific types of fungus. Because of the very small chance that an individual spore will find a suitable environment to germinate, a single mushroom will produce billions of spores. Although a single spore cannot be seen without a microscope, if we place a mushroom cap on a clean surface for several hours, so many spores will fall that a perfect reproduction of the cap will be created. This is called a spore print. These are very useful in identification because the color is more apparent than when looking at single spores under a microscope. To obtain a spore print, we had to cut the stem off the mushroom and place the bottom of the cap directly on a flat surface. If nature used this arrangement, there would be a billion mushrooms trying to germinate in a space that can accommodate only one. To prevent this situation is precisely the reason that mushrooms have stems. The inch or two fall provides adequate time for the spore to dry out and catch a puff of wind that can literally be the start of a trip around the world. If a spore lands in a suitable place with adequate moisture and organic nutrients, it germinates by sending out a tiny germ tube, which grows larger and begins to branch off in different directions. Each branch is called a hypha, and collectively the hyphae are known as the mycelium. In a sense, the mushroom is just the tip of an iceberg. The mycelium is the actual vegetative part of the organism. It is a cotton-like web that can so completely permeate a rotting log that mushrooms coming out of each end can be from the same mycelium. The so-called fairy ring is a single mycelium that can be hundreds of feet in diameter. 
Under the proper conditions of moisture, temperature, and light, the mycelium will thicken at its nodes and send up new mushrooms to start the process all over again. distinguishing visual characteristics of mushrooms is their spore producing area. By inspecting the underside of a cap we can immediately put it into one of three broad categories. The most common form produces spores on gills arranged like spokes of a wheel and is called a gill fungus. Another produces them in tubes packed closely together and is called a pore fungus. The third type produces its spores on long hanging projections and is called a tooth fungus. One of the other important characters useful in identifying fungi is the stem. Some have little or no stem at all. Many mushrooms have stems which are perfectly straight and smooth with nothing at all unusual about them. However, some mushrooms have a ring which is a remnant of the partial veil that encloses the cap and protects the delicate gills while pushing up through the soil. At maturity, the veil is ruptured as the cap opens up and leaves the ring on the stem. Other mushrooms have a complete veil, which totally surrounds it from base to cap. This is called the vulva, and upon rupturing, leaves not only a ring, but a cup at the base. All of the deadly Amanita mushrooms have this vulva, and it is therefore a good idea to always check the base before a mushroom is removed from the ground. All of these mushrooms disperse their spores by simply letting them fall and relying on the wind to carry them away. There is one group of mushrooms whose drooping design would have spores falling on top of each other if they hadn't evolved a very special method of dispersal. This time-lapse sequence shows us what happens in a period of about 48 hours after the spores have ripened. The entire fruiting body digests itself into an ink-like substance that is washed away by rainfall. Another rain-dispersed fungus is the geastrum, or earth star. In this group, the spores ripen in a star-shaped cup, which fills up with rainwater, so that each drop scatters a few more spores. The puffball relies on the assistance of animals to disperse its spores. Each time it is touched or stepped on, it sends out a cloud of spores to be carried by the wind. Any discussion of mushrooms inevitably turns to the subject of edibility. Most mushrooms are harmless but inedible because they are too hard and woody to eat or just plain taste bad.
Many mushrooms are edible and range from tasteless to highly prized as gourmet delights. The poisonous mushrooms vary from causing unpleasant stomach upsets to the deadliest toxins known to man. The innocuous looking death cap Amanita is 100% fatal within one hour of eating with no known antidote. The most insidious part of mushroom lore is the vast number of old wives tales by which the safe ones can be told from the poisonous. The fact is that none of them work with more than one kind of mushroom and most of them are pure nonsense. In most cases, the only sure identification is to compare a whole specimen with a detailed scientific description, which frequently includes microscopic examination of the spores, clearly not for the casual collector. In some cases, the physical characteristics are so distinctive that a positive identification can almost be made from a good picture. In this case, we have Morcella semilibra, a very edible morale. However, under no circumstances should any wild fungus ever be eaten unless all of the characteristics agree with the description. Fortunately, some of the poisonous mushrooms are equally unmistakable. The deadly fly amanita is the only brilliant red mushroom with white flecks on it. Unfortunately, there are also hundreds of mushrooms that look alike. The so-called LBMs, or little brown mushrooms, can stump an expert. Of course, the safest way to fill a collecting basket is at the grocery store. The mushroom sold commercially is a variety of the wild field mushroom, Agaricus compestris. They are grown by professionals under controlled conditions to prevent any possibility of contamination by dangerous species. This operation near Chicago is quite typical. The Hasselman family has been growing mushrooms here for 50 years. Most of the mushrooms grown here are sold to wholesalers who distribute them to food stores but they also do a thriving business right out of the office. Mm -hmm. Although mushrooms have virtually no nutritional value, the taste of a freshly picked mushroom is well worth the drive out. The growing season starts with the filling of hundreds of boxes with fresh compost. This compost is made from a mixture of manure and straw, which has been allowed to biologically decompose for several months. At the end of this time, it contains the appropriate nutrients for mushrooms and smells like clean dirt. The boxes are held on shelves in the growing rooms, which are maintained in total darkness. The only lights allowed are the headlamps of the workers. Commercial mushrooms are grown from what growers call spawn. This is purchased from laboratories that specialize in mushroom spawn. They germinate mushroom spores in a normal way on a growth medium such as grain. When a mycelium is well established on the grain, further growth is inhibited by cooling. It is then packed in bags and shipped to the growers. The spawn is sprinkled on the compost as though they were sowing seeds. If the temperature and humidity are correct, the mycelium resumes its growth After about two weeks, when the mycelium completely covers the compost, it is covered with a layer of topsoil called casing. 
This causes the mycelium to send up fruiting bodies, and in about another two weeks, mushrooms appear. For a number of reasons, mushrooms must be picked by hand. No machine has been developed with the discrimination of human pickers. They are picked with a twisting motion to minimize the damage to the mycelium left behind. The root end is removed with a knife to reduce cleaning requirements. But most importantly, because mushrooms develop so quickly, they must be picked every day. Once a mushroom opens to expose its gills, it is no longer marketable. A new flush of mushrooms appears about every 10 days until the nutrients in the compost are used up. A mushroom season lasts from three to four months so that several crops can be harvested each year. We now say goodbye to the Hasselmans and continue our journey through the fungi kingdom. We have been discussing mushrooms as though they were the essence of fungus, while in fact they represent an almost insignificant part of the fungi kingdom. Fungi are probably the most diverse group of organisms on Earth. size from basketball-like giant puffballs to microscopic moats. Some are soft as jelly. Others are as hard as wood. Some are terribly destructive and cause millions in crop damage every year. Corn smut is a fungus which turns the tassels, kernels, and even leaves of healthy corn into grotesque masses of dusty black spores. This farmer is losing about one-third of his harvest to a fungus. Some fungi have immense economic importance. The ability of yeast fungus to convert sugar into carbon dioxide and alcohol is essential to the alcoholic beverage industry. And of course, without yeast, bread just wouldn't be bread. Yeast is a microscopic fungus consisting of but a single cell.
Fungi have also relieved immeasurable human suffering by being the source of powerful antibiotics such as penicillin and streptomycin. Penicillin was first isolated in a green mold growing on a piece of rotting fruit and takes its name from the fungus Penicillium notatum. Although bacteria are responsible for the cheese making process, it is a fungus that gives many cheeses their distinctive flavors and colors. Blue cheese is a product of the fungus Penicillium rocaforti. There is a whole group of fungi with a very animal-like ability to move about. The so-called slime mold creeps around very much like an amoeba. Some of them are very large and can move several feet in a matter of a few hours. Slime molds have been the inspiration for many science fiction monsters. The life stage in which the slime mold moves about is called the plasmodium and is the vegetative form analogous to the mycelium. Movement is accomplished by streaming the cell cytoplasm into an extension of the cell wall. This is followed by a reversal in direction of the cytoplasm which again stops and reverses, always bringing more into the extension than it takes out. When looking at this thing, it isn't hard to understand why science has had a difficult time deciding just what to call it. Is it a plant or an animal? Or maybe just a missing link between the two? As the plasmodium creeps along, it feeds on bacteria, molds, and other fungi. When it has reached maturity, the plasmodium consolidates itself into jelly-like strands and sends up fruiting bodies called sporangia. These look like miniature mushrooms and contain the spores for the next generation. We now come to the least understood but most important contribution made by the world of fungi. The words rot and decay bring to mind the thoughts of the gross and disgusting. However, when you consider that every living organism from the smallest bacteria to giant whales eventually die, it is comforting to know that nature has provided us with an efficient and self-sustaining disposal system. When something rots, it is simply being eaten by something else. As we all know, when something is eaten and digested, the byproducts are not always the most pleasing to our human senses. Fortunately, every organism has its own idea of what is pleasing. Otherwise, the earth would long ago have been buried in its own waste. The earth's disposal system is based upon a complex web of the eaters and the eaten. At the bottom of this food chain is the plant kingdom, which, with the aid of sunlight and photosynthesis, converts the raw materials of the earth to starches and sugars. These are used by plants to build living organic tissue, the food source for the animal kingdom. Animals, of course, consume prodigious amounts of plant tissue and reduce it to some of the basic raw materials. But there are far more plants than can be utilized by the animals of the world. The 
vast majority of plant material simply dies off and falls to the ground. It is the fungi that convert nature's litter into nutrients required by plants. Fungi can convert a dead tree into fertilizer in a matter of a few years. Were it not for the fungi, the earth would long ago have run out of raw materials at about the same time that the topmost leaves reached the stratosphere. Many trees and plants are associated with fungi which grow on or within their roots and actually feed the plant by converting the soil humus into nitrogen. This relationship is very successful and has given us the lushness and beauty of the tropical jungle. The orchid family has evolved a dependence upon fungi which goes far beyond simple nutrition. The seed of an orchid is extremely small and will not germinate unless first pierced by the hypha of a specific fungus. The fungus grows by consuming part of the seed and the orchid grows by consuming the growing mycelium. If it is a healthy, viable seed, it grows into a healthy plant. If the fungus grows faster than the seed, the orchid simply becomes fungus food. This symbiotic relationship of fungi to plants is most importantly manifested in the lichens. These are the colonizers of otherwise barren and rocky places. A lichen is a fungus that is a host to a colony of single-celled plants. These algae produce food for the fungus through photosynthesis, while the fungus produces a safe environment for the algae. This electron microphotograph shows the algal cells completely wrapped up in the fungal mycelium. Unfortunately, lichens are very sensitive to pollution, and only the hardiest can survive near populated areas. They are an important warning that something is seriously wrong. It becomes increasingly clear that nowhere in the natural scheme of things has man ever made a positive contribution. When you get right down to it, we, the animal kingdom, should be glad the plants and fungi made room for us. Considering our destructive nature, I suspect they would prefer that we just go away. <laughs>